Hello and welcome to our video on the definite integral and Riemann sums. Previously, you have learned about the derivative of a function, how to compute it, and where it can be applied. The derivative is one of the basic notions in calculus. The definite integral is another basic notion in calculus that has important applications in mathematics, life and physical sciences, and other domains. One of the things you can do with integrals is finding the area of a region bounded by the graph of a function and the x-axis over a closed interval. In fact, the problem of finding areas and volumes of regions bounded by curved lines and surfaces motivated the development of the subject. So let's start by taking a closer look at the following area problem. If f is a positive and continuous function, how can we calculate the area of the region bounded by the graph of this function and the x-axis over a closed interval AB. One natural way to approach this problem is to try and approximate the region A using simpler shapes, whose areas we know how to compute, such as rectangles. If we use only two rectangles, then clearly the approximation is not going to be a very good one. But if we then increase the number of rectangles, and use more and more of them, and then add up their areas, then the number that we get will become closer and closer to the area of the actual region. Here is a more detailed description of this process. If f from ab to r is a function, we can divide the interval ab into n equal subintervals of width delta x given by b minus a over n and choose n points called sample points c1, c2 to cn one in each subinterval. Then the sum f of c1 times delta x plus f of c2 times delta x and so on up to f of cn times delta x is called the Riemann sum and it approximates the area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis over the interval ab as long as f is positive. This long sum is nothing but the sum of the areas of the rectangles used to approximate the region. The width of each rectangle is delta x, and the height is determined by the value of the function on each of the sample points. The sample points can be anywhere in the interval. They can be left endpoints, right endpoints, midpoints, and so on. Here is a diagram that will help you understand the ingredients of a Riemann sum. Here we see the function, the interval, and we see how the interval was divided into n equal subintervals. In each subinterval, we chose a sample point, c1 in the first, c2 in the second, and so on. The width of each rectangle is the length of the subinterval, delta x, or b minus a over n. The height of every rectangle is determined by the value of f on each of the sample points. Now let's have a look at our first example. Approximate the area of the region S bounded by the curve f of x equals x square and the x-axis over the interval 0, 1 using a Riemann sum with four subintervals of equal width and right endpoints as sample points. Here we need to divide the interval 0, 1 into four equal parts. And so we get four subintervals, 0 to a quarter, a quarter to one half, one half to three quarters, and three quarters to one. And so the width of each rectangle, which is the same as the length of the subintervals, is equal to a quarter. The right endpoints that we get in this partition are the following quarter for the first subinterval, one half for the second subinterval, three quarters for the third subinterval, and one for the last subinterval. The Riemann sum, denoted here by S sub 4, will be equal to f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x plus f of x3 times delta x plus f of x4 times delta x. Each term represents the area of one rectangle out of the four. So the first term will be equal to a quarter squared, or 1 over 16, times delta x, which is a quarter. The second term is one-half squared, which is a quarter, times delta x, which is also a quarter. 
The third term is 3 quarters squared, or 9 over 16, times a quarter. And the last term is 1 square times a quarter. This gives 30 over 64, or 0 0.47. In order to be able to find the precise area of such regions, we need to find a way of computing the limit of many Riemann sums. For this purpose, we make the following definition. Let f from a, b to r be a continuous function and s, n a sequence of Riemann sums, one for each n, in which the widths of the subintervals are approaching zero, as n goes to infinity. The definite integral of f on a, b is the limit of all Riemann sums in that sequence, as n goes to infinity. We also have a notation for that limit. We use an elongated s which is also called the integral sign, or symbol. Then we write the function f of x, and then the symbol dx. The endpoints of the interval, a and b, are placed below and above the integral sign. Now let's have a look at an example of how to compute a definite integral. Compute the area of the region s bounded by the curve f of x equals x plus 1, and the x-axis over the interval 1 to 2. In other words, we need to find the definite integral of x plus 1 over the interval 1 to 2. Here, we are not going to compute a single Riemann sum, as Riemann sums only approximate areas. What we need to do is form a sequence of Riemann sums and then find their limit as n goes to infinity. So for each n, we are going to divide the interval 1 to 2 into n equal pieces and then find the corresponding Riemann sum. The width of each rectangle will be 1, the length of the interval 1 to 2, divided by n. If we use right endpoints in this example, then the right endpoint of the first subinterval will be 1 plus 1 over n. The right endpoint of the second subinterval will be 1 plus 2 over n, and so on. The right endpoint of the last subinterval will be 2. The corresponding Riemann sum will be given by the usual formula, f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x, and so on. Recall that the function f of x is x plus 1. So when we compute f on the first right endpoint, we get 1 plus 1 over n plus 1, or 2 plus 1 over n and then times delta x, which is 1 over n. The second term, f of x2 times delta x, will be equal to 2 plus 2 over n times 1 over n, and so on. The last term will be 2 plus n over n times delta x, which is 1 over n. When we expand, we will get two types of terms. 2 times 1 over n will be obtained n times, and when we collect these terms, we get 2 over n times n. The other type of terms will be 1 over n square, 2 over n square, 3 over n square, and so on, all the way up to n over n square. When we collect these terms and factor 1 over n square, we can write them as 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n, all of that times 1 over n squared. And that's the expression for Sn. In the next step, we are going to use an algebraic formula for the sum of the first n positive integers. Using that formula, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. And so Sn becomes n n plus 1 over 2 times 1 over n square plus 2. We can simplify this expression, and we end up with 2.5 plus 1 over 2n. This expression approximates the area of the region S when we use n rectangles. To find the precise area of S, we need, of course, to take the limit as n goes to infinity. So the area of S will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 2.5 plus 1 over 2n. 
as 1 over 2n goes to 0 when n goes to infinity, the value of the limit is 2.5. In other words, the integral of x plus 1 from 1 to 2 is equal to 2.5. Note that in this example, the region S is a very simple region, and we can in fact split it into a rectangle and a triangle and add up the areas of these two simple shapes. Of course, when we do that, we end up with the same answer, 2.5. But this can be done only when the function is extremely simple. So in the first example, we saw how to calculate a single Riemann sum, a number that approximates the area of a region bounded by the graph of a given positive function and the x-axis. In the second example, we saw how to compute the actual area of such regions, or more precisely, the definite integral, by computing the limit of Riemann sums. As you can see, working with Riemann sums and computing their limits can be a long and somewhat complicated process. There is a better alternative, which is discussed in our video on the fundamental theorem of calculus. But right now, let's have a look at some of the basic properties of definite integrals. 1. If b is less than a, then the integral from a to b is equal to minus the integral from b to a. This is a useful convention that makes some of the other rules work in much more generality. 2. The integral from a to a of f of x dx is equal to 0, which makes sense, as we in fact integrate over a point. 3. The integral from a to b of a constant times a function is equal to that constant times the integral from a to b of the function. 4. The integral from a to b of a sum or a difference of two functions is equal to the sum or the difference of the two integrals. And finally, the integral from a to c of a function is equal to the sum of the integrals from a to b and from b to c of the same function. To understand this property, have a look at the diagram. The sum of the two integrals on the right-hand side represent two areas, and when you add up these two areas, you get the area of the region bounded by the graph of the function and the x-axis over the full interval that goes from a to c. Now let's move on to example number three. Suppose that f and g are integrable, meaning that they can be integrated, and that the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx is equal to 7, the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx is equal to 2, and the integral from 0 to 3 of g of x dx is equal to negative 1. Use the rules for definite integrals to find the following three definite integrals. For part a is quick, the integral from 3 to 3 of g of x dx is 0, as the upper bound and the lower bound are the same. In part b, the integral from 2 to 3 of f of x dx can be written as the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx minus the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx. Here we use one of the properties that we introduced before, and the fact that the integral from 0 to 3 can be written as a sum of the integral from 0 to 2 plus the integral from 2 to 3. Now the integral from 0 to 3 of the function f is known to be 2, and the integral from 0 to 2 is given to be 7. And so we end up with 2 minus 7, or negative 5. Finally, in part c, we need to find the integral from 3 to 0 of 2 times f of x dx. Again, using some of the properties, we know that we can switch the bounds of integration and write it as an integral from 0 to 3, but then we need to introduce a negative sign. And we can also pull out the constant 2 and put it in front of the integral. So we get negative 2 times the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx. This is equal to negative 2 times 2 
or negative 4. Here is one last example in which we use geometry to compute a definite integral. Compute the integral from negative 1 to 2 of the function absolute value of x, dx. If we look at the diagram, we see that this integral represents the sum of the areas of two triangles. So when we add up the areas of the two triangles, we get 1 half, that's the area of R1, plus 2, which is the area of the triangle R2. The final answer is therefore 2.5. To summarize, a Riemann sum is a number that approximates the area of a region bounded by the graph of a given positive function and the x-axis. By taking the limit of Riemann sums, we can find the precise area of such regions. If the function is negative, the integral will be negative, but its absolute value will still represent area. If the function is simple enough, we might be able to use geometry and compute a definite integral without using Riemann sums. As I already mentioned, integrals are used in many places. They can be used to compute areas and volumes, to find the average value of a function, to solve differential equations, and more. They are used in other sciences and are closely related to derivatives. We end this video with a few exercises. Give them a try. That's your opportunity to review the topic and practice. So good luck with the exercises, and thank you for watching.